So um, I was feeling quite confident about this until I came in and heard Francis's talk, which is virtually the same as this. So uh, apologies for the repetition, but um, you know, maybe it's triangulation or something along those lines. Um, so as a small bit of background, um, I'm Michael Mortensen from the University of Warwick. I teach on the digital and data science specialism, uh, and my work really combines what I would call sort of traditional OR flavoured analytics, some of the data science flavoured analytics, but I also have this slice of work where I'm looking at um, cloud-based technologies and really how organisations transform uh, to a cloud-native kind of approach. So I've kind of got a bit of a technology plus analytics piece. And really this talk is meant to be around how, what we can perhaps learn from what's happening in the technology space at the moment, very much like Francis was saying, and how that might apply to analytics projects and the challenges that might bring. So the first thing to say, I mean, as we all know, technology is full of hype, but it's my argument and my, my firm belief that um, some of the changes that are being realised now, particularly with a cloud-first approach to things like software development, some of the things uh, Francis already touched upon this morning, are fundamentally changing the way we do things. They're going beyond just hype into an actual, real, tangible change. In particular, the two things I'm flagging here, as Francis talked about this morning, this idea of DevOps, which is a, a change to the process of how IT is built and how IT is hosted, into a much more unified, joined team approach. And the other thing I wanted to touch on, which fortunately Francis didn't mention, so I've still got a little bit of unique content, is uh, cloud-native computing which is a way of developing applications, developing IT services that is cloud-first, that has no um, anchors to a traditional way of doing things and looks at what the benefits cloud can offer in this space. And really, with that question of how we may adopt some of these ideas and challenges into analytics projects. But uh, again, just to sort of explain your terms as a good academic, um, I would position analytics as having kind of two flavours, one which is born out and often linked to data science as a, 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 a vague term. Uh, and certainly in terms of universities, when we're seeing data science degrees, they're coming out of the computer science schools and the technology schools. And these are generally recruiting graduates who have done their undergraduate degree in a technology and computing flavoured topic. And on the other side, the more traditional uh, to most people, I would hope, in the room, OR type approach, probably coming out of the business schools and so on. So my view is that the, uh, the, the supply chain, if you like, going into these roles, we've got a group of people coming from this side, from a computing school, and a group of people coming from this side, from a business school. I'm more primarily aiming um, my talk to the right-hand side, because I think a lot of these people will be more embedded into IT teams and these technologies by default. So really, for the... Uh, OR trained analyst, the OR trained analytics specialist. What do these new technologies mean? Is there new ways of working that we can adopt? Just to slightly elaborate on that, so to give my definitions of, uh, of OR and data science, just a background. So my OR definition is an application area for fields such as mathematics, statistics and econometrics, primarily with a focus on real world problems and providing inputs for decision making. I was very pleased to see this sign here has a very similar definition, so I think I've done okay. Um, data science, I see fairly similarly. An application area for other fields, particularly high-performance computing and machine learning, where the focus is on, again, real-world problems, but primarily in creating digital and data products. So by default, my conceptualization of data scientists, they are going to be producing software primarily anyway. For those of us whose principal output is not software, what can we learn from this change? I think I've covered that. Okay, so agile is a phrase that's been around for a very, very long time. There are clear and obvious benefits to working in a more agile way. As a simplistic definition, I'm calling that just really breaking down work into smaller chunks of work rather than tacking big projects on that. As a whole, we break it down into logical sprints or iterations. And in doing that, we add a huge amount more visibility to the stakeholders so you can see how the project is progressing because we're delivering work on a more regular basis. It makes us automatically more adaptable because 
We're only working in small chunks, therefore if changes come down the line, there's less that they'll impact. It gives us a quicker path to business value and at the same time reduces the risk. So I have a couple of quotes from the Agile Manifesto and really I just want to think how well do these describe the way that we do analytics, particularly if we come from a more OR background. So one of their, their, their uh, principles is that the highest priority being satisfying customers through early and continuous delivery of software. Most OR-infused analytics projects that I see in a traditional sense very much are, are start and end type projects. We do the work and then we deliver something at the end. So this idea of continuous delivery of valuable software, even if we say valuable insights, I think that can be lacking in the traditional OR project. Welcoming changing requirements, even late in development, no one ever welcomes changing requirements, let's be honest, but it's in the manifesto. But I think, again, the way we structure some of these projects do not make us very flexible or able to react to change as well as we could. I'll skip from there just to make up some time. So, as I said at the start, Agile has been around for a long time. The dirty secret about Agile is this. Agile is like teenage sex. Everyone talks about it. Nobody really knows how to do it. Everybody thinks everyone else is doing it, so everyone claims that they are doing it. All these businesses say they are agile, but when you scratch beneath the surface, most of them work in a very waterfall way. I think there's some degree of human nature to want to have this flow of work in a typical waterfall system, to have these projects all the way through. And certainly, us in universities are partly to blame, because we teach everyone the scientific methodology which follows that very waterfall type approach. One of the reasons I think Agile never really reached its full potential at that time is that fundamentally Agile just targets one silo in the IT cycle. The IT cycle, loosely defined here, as a flow between the design of software, the development of software, QA, security and testing, as Francis was talking about, and then operations where the application or service is actually deployed. The problem that Agile hit was that it was really only focused on development. And so, as Francis was talking about this morning, once that development stage finished, it then gets stuck in QA, it then gets stuck in an operations queue. All that performance gain we might have captured by changing the way we develop is then lost in the cycle. So the idea of DevOps is to sort of break down those silos and see software development, application development as a continuous flow through the cycle. So again, as Francis was talking about this morning, developers working hand in hand with security and testing people, testing throughout the process, and thinking about uh, the deployment issues of operations right from the start. Uh, I will skip through that one as well. Okay, so if you haven't gathered already, DevOps is seen as the intersection of these three separate silos of software development, the, the guys doing the development themselves, the QA and testing teams, and then finally the operations teams. So my question is, what would that look like in terms of a traditional analytics project? And in sh uh, a period of shameless self-promotion from a paper I published on the area, we um, encapsulated analytics as this combination of technologies, primarily computing technologies, data capture, databases, and so on. A quantitative stage, which is probably where I think most people in this room are, are mostly situated, and then a decision-making piece at the end. So some kind of integration with the final decision-maker, some work on change management and implementation, as we talked about earlier. So what would DevOps look like in this uh, Venn diagram? So I'm, I'm arguing for the technology piece needs to be flexible, analyst-friendly technology. And we had a great example of this with the tools that uh, Benjamin and his team have been developing. At the other end of the pipeline, I think we need to push towards visual interactive solutions. Again, we just had a great example of that. Tools that the client themselves can use, can adjust things, test things, perform what if analysis. But the bit I'm perhaps most interested in is this middle piece. Um, and I would push for an approach that is more simple first, scalable later. That taking that agile view, we need to start with, rather than delivering whole projects, delivering pieces of a project in a way that can go to the end user straight away. The end user can hopefully interact with them in our visual software, check our assumptions, see if what we're doing is working in the right way, potentially update their requirements, because no one really knows what they want in life, right? 
and that allows us to then build in a scalable way down the line. Um, so the second topic, my more unique contribution, if you like, for the day, is around this concept of cloud-native computing, which is rethinking the way we design applications for a cloud-first way. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these, but if anyone's interested, the uh, link is on that slide for the 12-factor app, and that details, that's the manifesto, if you like, of this new way of thinking. Um, and inside that, there's all sorts of concepts that really are enabled by the cloud. I mean, load balancing is an old concept, but it's on here because it leads me into something more interesting. But this is the idea that an application or a website wouldn't sit on a single server. We have replications of the same thing across multiple servers, and we have a load balancer sitting in front of it. So in, in the simplest way of making that load balancer work, which is round robin, as the first customer arrives, they're sent to server one, the next customer to server two, and so on. As I say, nothing particularly new here that's been around for a while. What has got more interesting, there's a company called Kubernetes, which is a spin-off. We normally just say K8 because it's easier to remember, which is a spin-off from Google. And they've built, kind of on top of this idea, a network of containerized applications, so applications that are running in multiple servers, and it's a management system that sits on top of it. So there is um, a, a, a part, a module in Kubernetes, which is called Replication Controller. And they basically act as a monitor of the whole system. And they ask questions like, is the system too busy? And if it is, it automatically spins up another version of the application on another machine and adds that to the load balancer. Even more interesting, it can also see if one of the instances or one of those machines is having a problem and has died, and in which case they can not only spin up an alternative machine, but using um, databases like Memcached or Redis, which are session store databases, it's actually recorded every action the customer's taken on that web page. So when we remove that customer to a new server, you notice nothing. You can still see your shopping basket with all your items. You can even click backwards to the previous page. So for the user, it becomes a seamless experience, no downtime, and we've always got infinite bandwidth to fulfill needs. But where this gets interesting is it's kind of changed the way that we think about machines. It used to be we think about machines like pets, and we take great care of them, and if they get injured, we take them to the vets, and we put a plaster cast on them, and we patch them, and we add security to them, and we treat them with love and care. In this kind of cloud-native market, we think of them as cattle. So it's a rather unpleasant metaphor in some way, but when the, the, the cow in the, in, the in the agricultural plant dies, it just becomes meat. There's far less, there's no funeral, there's no real song sound, and we just move on. Um, and that's really now the way in development in a cloud-native world we think about machines. So my question is, is this something we need to embrace a bit more in the operational side of analytics, operational research side of analytics? My view at the moment is that most of our projects work something like this. We do our requirements, we build a project, we go away for six months, however long it is. We come back with some recommendation and we all go home. What I'm arguing perhaps for is that a different view of modelling, where our models aren't our handcrafted works of art that are little babies that we patch up and look after, but we see them more as cattle in this sense. We see them perhaps as inputs for future models or just a way of building some visualisation where the actual modelling is then done by the end user. Uh, additional to this, and the same, moving on neatly, so I'm sure we've seen these things. It used to be every software we used, every time we logged on our machine, we'd get these messages saying there's a new version available, would you like to update? Uh, I suspect you'll agree with me that you see less of this today. Uh, and the reason for that is we've really changed the model of where software lives. So I, I go back far enough to remember uploading computer games onto my Amstrad CPC 464 from a cassette, and it would take half an hour to come up and actually load to the next level. In that kind of world where everything needs to be installed, we have to think very long and hard about our releases. We don't want to annoy the customer with small releases. In a world like um, Google Mail, which I'm sure lots of us use, no one ever downloads Google Mail. It's software as a service. It lives somewhere in the cloud. In that kind of world, we can send updates all of the time. And in fact, we do. 
So the, the standard journey that's talked about um, is toward continuous delivery. The first step of that is continuous integration, which again comes into the talk we just heard. This is the idea of developers continuously, ideally every day, pushing their code to version control on GitHub or similar and integrating that code and testing that it goes together, ideally on a day-to-day -day basis. The next step in that journey is called continuous delivery. And the idea here is that once it's passed those integration tests in version control, it can be pushed straight to our test server and we can perform user acceptance testing. And if the user's then happy, that software goes live. The last step in the journey is called continuous deployment. And the idea here is that we, in fact, automate all of those things. Indeed, we can even automate user acceptance testing. And if we do that, without anyone touching anything or doing anything, our code can go live immediately. Uh, so software like the most well-known in this space is Jenkins. Jenkins allows you to build this visual web-based pipeline of what those stages will look like, code into that the automatic test that will be performed. The developer uploads the code to GitHub, presses the button, assuming it passes all of these tests, that code is live immediately on the end website or application. So there's a little company in Seattle called Amazon, you may have heard of. They do something like more than, they do more than 200 code deploys every single day. So not this idea of software being sent out every year or every two years. 200 times a day, I believe the record was 1,000 deploys in a single 24-hour period. So that application is constantly evolving on a day-by-day -day basis. Again, spinning this back to what this might mean for operational research and the operational research flavour of analytics. So one thing that I think is very important, and again we see a very good example of this here, is all of our model outputs, in my opinion, should be available to the end customer as an interactive interface, a dashboard or a model building tool themselves. This automatically extends the life of our work and it allows the user, the end user, to become the modeler to some extent and to push updates and keep things alive. The other thing I would touch upon is thinking a bit about, um, and it uh, overlaps very nicely with what Francis was talking about to, to my question, so I set it up nicely for myself, of simulation models becoming automatic, automatically updated and automatically built based on real-time data feeds. In some ways, we can maybe start to think of ourselves, think of our models, rather, as being the starting point for the next model. We run our model, we implement it, we have some result. Perhaps thinking in a Bayesian, updating kind of way, that work that we've done then just becomes the input, the prior for our next models, and so on. So I think I've managed to catch up time quite nicely. I'll just wrap up my summary slide. So for me, agile analytics means moving from an approach which is often aimed at slow and perfect, the way we were trained to do in universities, to something that's more about fast and good. Perfect slows you down too much. Let's just get things released and usable in the shortest amount of time. Breaking down silos, so we don't have this uh, waiting for the technology team to send us some data or give us access to whatever tools we need. We're working much more closely with them. And I think it's something we do well in OR anyway, but at the same time maintaining that integration with the final decision maker and whoever's implementing the stuff that we do. Starting to think of models as cattle, not pets, where we can spin up and build simpler but fast models and get them live much quicker. And when that model dies, we don't have the funeral, we just move on to the next one. Thinking of analytics, models, insights, more as a continual flow, not as a project with a start and the end, more as um, the continual delivery of insights, if you like, rather than a project that comes with a recommendation at the end. And finally, simple first, scalable later. Take the complexity out of what you do at the start. If we're adding complexity, if we're making things bigger and more complex, that just means we did the first job very well. And I think that's all I need to say, so I'm more than happy to answer any questions.